was at Tuggy University and um, in my first year, aged 18. And um, in the English tutorial, the, about 10 of us crammed into the small room and the lecturer said after about three sessions, um, we're going to change venues. I've got to know you all. I know you like the new venue and I'm changing the time too. It's now going to be four o'clock in the Captain Cook Hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so being a keen, enthusiastic um, uh, student, I got there at three just to warm up a bit and um, it was, none of you have been in a bar at three o'clock in the afternoon I hope but there aren't too many people there and some of them are a bit sort of dubious. Anyway there was this Murray chap leaning on the bar so I went on the bar and um, to show how intelligent and intellectual I was I said very pleased to see that Ralph Hotary got the Francis Hodgkins fellowship and he said yeah I was too I thought it was great and um, um, he said, um, can I buy you a beer? I said, yes, Ralph Kirk. He said, yes, Ralph Hotary. <laughs> and I was kind of happy. He invited me to a party that night at the studio and my fellow to Michael Smither and Jeffrey Harris. You probably possibly don't know those guys, but yeah. they were big names and learned in my time anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that launched me into the arts. And uh, yes. after leaving university, I went to London for three years and played chess of all things. <laughs> um, and I've got cheese and tomato sandwiches for two of those years before I've got a bit of steam behind me. But you do these things when you're young, and so I'm skirting around the arts. I collected contemporary New Zealand until sort of about 98, and then for the last 20 odd years I've been into photography. And uh, that started because uh, living in New Plymouth, um, one of the pilgrimages you should make is to the Gavette Brewster mm -hmm. Hotel. Hotel, sorry, yeah. art gallery, <laughs> um, and it's known as the um, actually um, the Lee Brewster because about ten years ago a new adjunct was put onto it called the Lee Lai Foundation. Then Lai, if you had to name two New Zealand artists who would fit into a top one thousand uh, of artists of the twentieth century, you'd think of Francis Hodgkins. And you probably don't think of Lean Line, but he was also very well known and acknowledged internationally, particularly in England and, and America. So, um, one of the other, my, another entrepreneur in New Plymouth persuaded Lean Line to bring his collection from New York to New Plymouth. He was an engineer and said, I'll make those designs of yours. Um, and so that's how that repository came there. And they finally managed to raise the money to to put up a Lin Lai gallery alongside the Gavit Brewster. So it's a great place mm. to go if you're interested in the arts. Mm. And it's quite unique. Um, you'd never find in a population centre of 70,000 people something like the, the Gavit Brewster and the Lin Lai. They're quite edgy mm. contemporary galleries. So I would recommend it to you. Anyway, um, we had a wonderful director there called Greg Burke at one stage, and Greg was probably the only New Zealand um, art gallery director to get a major international appointment. He was our Venice Biennale fellow for a while, and one of the Venice Biennales, he was the sort of director of it. Mm -hmm. And um, he ended up as director of the um, major contemporary gallery in Canada. Um, the plant gallery, I think it's called, down on the waterfront in Toronto. And um, he was a good, close friend of mine. And through him and one or two other people, I met uh, uh, an artist who was, uh, Greg was, had worked with before, called Peter Perrier. And have you heard of Peter Perrier at all? Mm -hmm. No, well, he was probably the uh, major driving influence in early contemporary New Zealand photography. I don't know if they teach him much about the history of photography these days, but it's worth study. Um, Ethel McCready, has anyone heard of him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's good. He's uh, at Te Papa, mm -hmm. and he's the director, he's in charge of photography at Te Papa, and he's published some great books. Um, and um, the most recent one is about the very early New Zealand photographers, which would include Anne's Westry, who we've heard of, mm -hmm. uh, Marty Friedlander, mm -hmm. people like that, and a few mm -hmm. others who aren't that well known. And then that was, they were practicing photography, which was unknown as an art form in New Zealand in the 1960s onwards. 
And that's when I personally ran contemporary New Zealand photography as having started. That was the genesis of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in the 1970s, in the mid 70s, we got people like my friend Ken Perrier and um, uh, um, Lawrence Everhart. I'm not sure if you've come across mm -hmm. him. Probably the most famous contemporary photography photograph in New Zealand photography history would be. Uh, Lawrence's um, photograph, The Heavens Declare, and that is a, a picture of a small observatory with those words inscribed on it, on top of Marsden Hill in New Plymouth, mm -hmm. and it's got a circular image in it, you know where they put the, put the, um, the, the telescope and the rectangular bottom, and then in the background there is Mount Taranaki as a mm -hmm. triangle and a triangular cloud coming off it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, it's just got everything when you come to form, shape, image, light. And I recommend that particular image to you if you get the opportunity to look it up. Uh, anyway, um, Greg was friends with Peter Perrier and he did um, a very um, well-known um, um, exhibition of Peter's work called Second Nature. And Second Nature also has a very good booklet with the Peter's work. Now behind you on that table I've left um, four um, books of Peter's work uh, from a big exhibition of his pre-1900 work. Peter died in, uh, in, 19, in 2018, mm. um, unfortunately. But anyway, he came to New Plymouth because of Greg Burke, who was running a, another exhibition for him. And um, that's when I sort of met Peter, he decided to stay on in New Plymouth because, as we know, artists don't always, it's calling, ladies and gentlemen, it's not necessarily a recipe to make big money, uh, but if you've got it in your blood, why not? If you can't follow your dream at your age, I don't know when you can. So I think you're doing the right thing. Um, anyway, Peter is one of those early pioneers who carried on and on and managed to earn a sort of a living. And uh, we had a really good relationship. I bought it and he produced it. <laughs> <laughs> so in some ways I, I consider myself now a patron of the arts through my sponsorship of Peter. Um, in a small way, and this, you may know something about this already, uh, Peter used to get his work done by the best um, uh, printer of, of photography in the country, a chap called Kevin Church. And Kevin was extremely good and had a lot to offer to the photographer. He didn't just say, what do you want, I'll do it. He would, you know, do his feedback from him. And it's great to get feedback at that early print stage. Should how, what should be the size of this work? Because early on, you see that they're all 240 by 120 or something, weren't they? They're just very small images. But as everything's got bigger in the world of art, um, so did photography. Now, of course, we have giant photographs sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but Peter, uh, what is great for, and the Gavit Brewster uh, Gallery, of course, was part of the attraction for Peter because of its edgy uh, colle uh, collection and the shows that are put on, and the fact that the directors only stayed for five years. And so you've got a, someone, they didn't waste time. They came in here, they did what they wanted to do. And then they went on to all sorts of things. Cheryl Sutherland went on from the Brewster to run, um, to, to build up to Papa. She was the founding, she was the project manager and, and, the, mm. and the direct first director of Papa. But so it's a really good place. Um, and um, Peter, uh, he started in the mid 70s and he, uh, a lot of his work, early work was experimental, but it was different. It wasn't nice pictures like you'd find in a Craig Cotton book, and um, there's no <laughs> reflection on Craig at all. It's just that Craig is documenting the New Zealand, um, the nature side of New Zealand, the bushes and the landscape, the bush, the landscape, etc. But um, Peter was, Peter's always been edgy in what he did. And a lot of his best work, you look at it and think, no, um, What's that all about? Why did he do that? <laughs> um, for example, you know those wooden um, serving spoons you get for salad? Mm -hmm. And you know, there's one like that and the other one's sort of 
like a ordinary spoon. Mm. You put two of those down and photograph them and put it up. Well, of course, this rage, everyone was amazed by this because, of course, it, it was a direct reflection, according to those um, art critics, of, um, uh, of American Gothic. Mm. You know, that famous picture of the husband standing there with the pitchfork and the wife mm. standing there holding a club or something. I don't know what it was. But, um, you know, and so there's this sort of interesting association. And so, in effect, my uh, collection of photography, which started in the late 90s when I sort of met Peter down there, was, um, uh, yeah, it, that turned me, that made me sell all my collection of contemporary New Zealand and switch to photography. Road to Damascus conversion. <laughs> <laughs> I thought to myself, why do I have to collect the same stuff all my life? Mm. And so I changed direction. Yeah. And it's been this great, you know, and I really got into it, into photography. Mm. And I met some amazing people through it. And I'm so glad that I did. And um, Peter did a series on his wife, Erica. Peter lived here in Devonport mm. for several years. <coughs> and um, uh, he, his wife, Erica, um, who he met at university um, was a good model, so he, he did a series of 18 images of her, all dressed up differently and with different expressions, different haircuts, and different backgrounds. And it's a great series if you're interested in portraiture. If you get hold of this little mimeograph by Justin Patton, who was director of photography down at um, Otago, at uh, Dunedin Public Art Gallery now running the international side of the Art Gallery New South Wales. Um, there's a lot of New Zealand experts, uh, the, mm, the previous photography director there in Art Gallery New South Wales was a, a woman who went through art school here in New Zealand, and, but all her practice was over there in, in, uh, in Sydney. So we've got a lot of good expats, you know, you can click into yeah. But photography, of course, has come a long way since those early days in the 70s. Um, and um, Peter went from about 1973 until he died. Um, in the 200, two, 2019 New Zealand Photography Festival, there's a well known New Zealand documentary photographer, uh, filmmaker, sorry, Shirley Horrocks. Have you been to Shirley? Mm -hmm. He's done lots of, um, probably um, done documentaries on about 10 New Zealand artists, photographers, and they're always looking at if you're interested in photography uh, and art, generally. Very good. And um, this, this, she did this wonderful um, uh, documentary on Peter, and she finished, got, as she said to me, she got the last filming that she needed in the can um, on the 6th of November 2018. And Peter's final words were, a lot of things have come right recently in my life. Um, my work is selling really well. Um, I've got an assistant who's organised everything perfectly for me because it was an absolute shambles at times out the back there. And um, Peter didn't pay enough attention at times to the business side. And really, if you want to be a professional artist these days, it's not just producing great art, it's having that ability to keep track of it when you give it to a dealer. You must keep a track of it and call it back after three months if it isn't been sold. Keeps the dealer on his toes. Otherwise it lies in their stock room until you forget about it. Um, and so, um, it, it is important to, to pay some attention to the business side of it. Know what you've got and get someone in. Well, if you can't do it, when you're starting out, you do it all yourself, of course. But of course it's a, a tension once you get well known and there's a demand for your work between people wanting to ring up and talk to you about your work and, um, and take up your time that way and um, want you to send them a copy of that image which they can put on the wall and have a look at it for a week and you know, a month later you ring up and say, well, what's happened? Um, and so you've got all this chasing around to do. But it is important to have some sort of business system as well as being great at what you do. But the, the trick is, of course, to have big chunks of time which are for you and your camera so you can go out there and do it. Um, and um, 
uh, people had finally got to that stage, and he said those were his final words on the, on the documentary. I've got, he was 78, I've got uh, many, many more images in my head that I want to take. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, that's all I want to do for the rest of my life. Well, he died 13 days later. Mm -hmm. So, that was a bit of a tragedy all around. Yeah. And um, so sad, really. But um, anyway, Peter struggled um, at times. He said it's pretty, uh, you lose a bit of self-respect when you see the linesman up the telephone pole outside your front gate disconnecting your phone because, you know, you haven't paid the bill. And, um, you know, you're living off bread and water, so to speak. But, I mean, you know, in those days, photography was not a well-known well -known, uh, form of art, not accepted. People, the other thing that happened over time. In those early days, no one ever additioned their work. You know what I mean by additioning? Mm -hmm. In other words, um, you know, printmakers. Printmakers, you, it's, it's de rigueur to have um, the, seri the number and the amount in the series. Like one bar 10 means that's number one in a series of 10 prints. Mm -hmm. And New Zealanders like that because they know Oh gosh, says the dealer, eight of these have been sold. You've only got two, two images left. He forgets to tell you there's a few artists' proofs around. But, um, <laughs> they've only got two left. So people know that out there there are only 10 of them. Mm. And so gradually what came in to New Zealand photography is that concept. Because otherwise people were thinking, oh gosh, he, that's a wonderful picture. And he wants, you know, $4,000 for that. But he could just print. No, you know, it could be just endless numbers of them. Whereas I've seen that painting over there, and that's an, it's an original, I think, you know, it's the same price, I think it'll go for that. But the additions, the additioning is important. Now, Peter worked in, he didn't have a set number of additions, it depends what he was printing at the time, and his feel for it. And at times there'd only be three in the, in the, um, in the edition. Yvonne Todd, have you heard of Yvonne Todd? Mm -hmm. Um, she was did all those famous pictures of those gals in, in um, Smith and Covey, the ones that sell all the makeup. Um, she put those people in front of a camera and hyper realism, mm -hmm. big photographs. But she always worked in small suites of about three to five. Peter worked at times in um, up to ten or twelve mainly, no more, uh, except at Christmas time. He ripped out a really good little Christmas photograph, um, and it could have been of anything, but we might do 50 of those and sell them all for $500, and you sell 40 of those, so how much does that give you? It's not a bad Christmas present down anyway, is it? <laughs> <laughs> 20 grand would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, you can vary it a bit, but essentially people are looking for small, additioned lots, so that they know what they're buying is limited. Now you might disagree with that. And the famous international photographers like Edward West and Ansel Adams, you know, those famous and Stieglitz, all those famous American photographers, they didn't in those days. But then of course America's got a population of what, four hundred million. So who cares? You know, mm. if you do ten thousand of them, you know, you relate it to the marketplace. Um, and um, but in New Zealand we've got a very small uh, collect. We've got a lot of people that like looking at art, but not, you know, spending four or five thousand on a picture or a photograph, there's a lot you could do with that. The car needs upgrading. We need a new roof on the house. You know, we have got to have a holiday in Fiji. Um, you know, so when people do want to spend money, they want to know they're getting value for money. And so I recommend to you that when you're thinking of doing an addition, you do addition it. And you do sign it because they like to see the signature as well. Mm. And you don't, with photo, photo photographs, um, you don't necessarily um, autograph on the front like you would with the print. It's on the back, mm -hmm. one bar twenty, you know, and the date must always have the date. That way, people can follow your work. And mm. ideally, what you want is some a nice person like me who comes along and wants to buy everything. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I had to because Kevin Church wasn't going to do my friend Peter's work unless he got paid within seven days for his edition. Yeah. 
So I would pay and get a discount. Yeah. And there are various ways of, um, of helping get your work out there. If, for example, you did an edition of Nine, and you thought, to me, these are my, it makes my best work. And um, I would like to get, ultimately, $3,000 a print for these. Now, you've got to test the market a bit, so how are you going to do that? So what would happen is Peter might sell three at a thousand. He wouldn't, but he'd be more than that, but he could sell three at a thousand. And then the, when they go, the next three are 1,500, and the last three are 3,000. You know, that mm -hmm. sort of trick. There's all sorts of tricks to promote your work, but don't under try not to undervalue yourself. I feel really sad when I see people who put a lot of time effort and energy into things and you only have to pay hundred dollars for it. That's sad to me. But when I look on the back of that word, has it got one out of three on it? Has it been signed? Has it got the date on it? And that makes me want to think, well this is this is interesting. You know, there's there's something going on there that I quite like. Um, but you know, it needs a bit of spotting here and things like that. But um, you know what's going on on the back of it. I want to know the value. I want to know where I am. I always try to buy number one and keep the stuff. But no, that's a good, crazy reason. But I always like to be number one. <laughs> um, so that's 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 just a few tricks around collecting. What I really liked about Peter's work was, um, and I've got 185 images of his, um, is uh, this, a lot of his best work, for the first five years as a as starting out, he had one of those small cameras, um, Dianas. Diana, have you heard of a Diana camera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had a Diana, and he did this, what he called his moody blues period, where it's all really nice, dark, light contrast, interesting structures, things like that. He told me once that he had one tutorial, and it was from an American <coughs> who came to New Zealand to teach, this is in the 1970s, at um, Eden Art School in Christchurch. And this guy went up to in um, Auckland. And um, uh, the, that chap Turner, what's his Christian name then? Um, famous in New Zealand photography history, lectured at um, and, sorry, Christchurch's island, Eden was in, in, in Auckland. But anyway, Mr. Turner jacked up, you know, about 10 photographers to come and have a tune with this guy. And he said, all right, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. You've all bought a work and I've looked at it, yeah. I want you to go out and photograph for the next 24 hours and then bring me back to the place. So they sweated all night in the dark room producing all this stuff. And he'd come in and he'd say, yeah, I kind of like that, but yeah. the rest of it's a bit of a cliche. And he'd go like that. Hear it, give it to you, and say, Go and do more work like that. <laughs> I mean, wow. <laughs> I think nine people seen through the floor in tears because they had done their beautiful Peter said, That's a fly, what? And away he went. But um, so for the first five years, he was doing that light, dark shadow thing. He, um, I think Peter started in 73, and in 75, he was an international, he was in an, an international photographic hard book magazine produced in the States with people like Lee Friedlander, who's a very, very well known and famous American photographer, and lots of other famous photographers from around and famous from around the world. Um, and it did some of his early work. So, you know, it is possible to do well from here, but you've got to take a you must not underestimate the value of your work. You must addition it. You must sign it, you must date it. And don't sell it for nothing. <laughs> it's a, it, is a, it is a balance between getting the price that's fair to you and actually getting the work out there, because it is a bit distressing, isn't it? And it's all sitting in the bottom drawer, because we're here to try and you know, make some money out of photography and, and burn out of it. So anyway, I, I started collecting Peter and went on and on and on and on collecting Peter. And, um, I also met Lawrence Everhart. I don't know if you know any of Lawrence's work. Does anyone have a, um, seen his work? He's a, he's a different sort of photographer. He did 55 different images of the inside of, Hoki, of the Hokianga churches, the Northern churches. And amazingly, they were beautiful 
he, this big thing, and he's still good. He's in the dark room these days, which is amazing. I mean, you'll all be using digital cameras to take the shots, or cameras, but not, do you spend a lot of time in the dark room anymore? No. You see, it's just sort of gone, that kind of thing. But it was hard work, sweet, smelly, even dangerous, some would say. But um, Lawrence was still in there doing that stuff, and his prints are beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And um, uh, very just classic um, production stuff, but interesting too. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. And he'd, he'd do a series, he was a series man. Now he went around New Zealand photographing all the war models, and I spoke to him. And World War, you know, there were these ones that sprung up after World War One, and then they put World War Two on. Um, I spoke to him about ten years ago, twelve years ago. Lawrence said he was doing this project. I said, "What are you doing that for?" He said, "Because 1914 is coming up, and the people will want to exhibit these." And indeed, the Auckland Art Gallery fell open, so I was trying to, trying to, um, trying to to do that. And the other thing, of course, when you when you're wanting to make a career out of um, Photography is um, eventually you want a dealer. So how do you get a dealer? <laughs> Anyone got any ideas on that? Mm. Apart from marching in and showing things, you've got to have me. I'm really good. Uh, no, well, I mean there are various techniques to do that. Um, where where have we been studying? Yeah. Elam, yeah. Well, of course it's the Elam Art Show every year, isn't it? Yeah, the end of year thing. The biggest contingent of people that are in there on the first day are gallery directors <laughs> looking for the next big thing. So um, it's worth putting in quite a lot of effort, you know, in, in your gallery exhibition, if you like. So um, I've um, my, my collection essentially is mainly based on those two, Peter Perry and Lawrence Everhart, but I've got about a dozen and Nobles. Um, half a dozen Mateo Scoop um, and uh, some other classic New Zealand photographers. I've got about 10 in my, my smaller collection, you know, where I, I started out wanting to do two or three images by Anne Wester and Marty Friedlander and others, but it sort of got a bit out of control in relation to some of them, but that's all right. Mm. And I never really pursued others, I only got one or two images, but but that's so uh, my collection is mainly Aberhart, Perry, and probably about 10 other New Zealand photographers from that contemporary period. I don't buy outside of that period. Mm. I try, I'm different to a lot of people who, who see what they like and like what they see and buy it. I'm, 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 I'm concentrated in trying to collect pe a few people in depth. Mm. So I've got a really good collection. Mm. And one day when I'm finished with my just about finished with my life, I intend to donate my period collection to the Auckland City Art Gallery because I think I've had so much fun collecting it. I don't want to put it in the in the auction house and sell it on. I'd rather give it as a, a lot to to um, to the art gallery. The other important thing to keep is your archive. You know all your the letters that you got, the letters that you wrote, the copies of them. The, the old cameras you started with, um, any prints that you had and discarded. Um, you can't keep your best one and three uh, or one and five because you've got to sell them, so you can keep going. But uh, you may keep the old one. But, but really, you know, that your history, your archive is important because if you do become successful, um, the places like the Auckland Art Gallery have three archivists, full time archivists sweeping up collections. I'm negotiating to, to give mine to Auckland Art Gallery and they want to interview me about it because it's all sitting in here. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got a whole lot of correspondence with Peter which will accompany him. I've managed to persuade the, the executives of his estate to give Peter's archive there so they will have the archive in my collection. And that's, that's gold according to um, the Auckland Art Gallery. I'm one of the executives in the estate, so I have a pretty good stance <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but um, so that's just mm. a few observations. Oh, the, the last thing I've been collecting is international.
because my daughter went through Ealing and she now works for Christie's in London selling French impressionism all over the world. Um, out of, and that was on the background of experience at Ealing and working in art galleries around, uh, around Auckland. Mm -hmm. So um, photography, I reckon, is, is great. Um, and uh, there's so many of us interested in it. When the public galleries run surveys on what people want to see, inevitably it's more photography. Because we've all got cell phones and we're all going around click, 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 click. My God, look at what I did about a dog or whatever, you know. Um, and so people are interested in looking at really good photographs to learn. So um, I'm always hammering away at Auckland City Art Gallery trying to get them to do more photography. And if I can't get what I want, I tend to underwrite it and someone curate it to go and put it together for me so I can send it round. <laughs> but so those are, you'll come across old people like me very often. But um, it, it's worth, um, I found it very bored, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Mm. I hope that hasn't gone on too long. That's a great one. Thank you. <laughs> any, any questions at the stage from anyone? Um, I was just about that, you know, the kind of point of difference, like the point of difference between the kind of school that likes to see more than just um, a, there is a place for people who do just a beautiful landscape photograph but I like something more going on there. One of my other early influences was um, flapping with a, an artist, Graham Sidney, I don't know if you've come across Graham's work, he was a, um, a landscape painter and based in central Otago and um, he's produced several books of his work and, and He's only ever had one exhibition, and that was back in 1976. Um, he has a stack of people a mile long who um, want his work, and he takes a 20% deposit off them and tells them what it's going to cost them, and they wait until the work's ready, and then it's offered to them. If they don't want to buy that particular work, then they go to the bottom of the queue again, and it goes through like that. <laughs> but he, in his landscapes, there is a, there's never any people, mm. but he used to put images of buildings. There's a lot of buildings in central, ancient buildings in central Otago. You don't get much dry rot or anything up there because it's too hot in summer and too cold in winter. And um, so they just decay slow, very slowly, and there'll be something in it, like a small shed, or fairly broken down but not completely, or a bath in the middle of a paddock or whatever. But, um, you know, he was another one. He painted an egg tempera, which is the Renaissance mm -hmm. way of painting. Do you know what egg tempera is? Mm. Paint pigment mixed with egg yolks. So we had a hell of a lot of pavlovas in that flat. So those are sort of formative influences. Mm -hmm. and I, I got alongside a gallery director, an amazing guy called Mark Marshall Cycle. He was a dealer in the this is all a student down there. And uh, he kind of took a bit of time with me to explain about you know, various artists and, and their work. And I found that very helpful and early on in my career. Peter did the same for me. He was very generous with his um, advice. In other words, I'd say, Peter, I think I like this work by Mark Freeman. He'd say, yeah, that's not really you know, one of the better ones because of A, B, C, D, E. But if you're looking for that type, So it's great like that. <laughs> so what was it that you studied that first put you in contact with all these people in the residency? And and I'm sorry, I'm a student. Okay, and then just from that you just started being interested in it? That's... Yeah, I, I um, kind of got switched on to it. I know I'm a chess player, and chess is an art yeah. in a way, and so we move in those series. And I was also a provincial cricketer, so I was sort of a split personality at the university. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, 
after they get to them, right vision and Ryan Vogel, the apps, or his study was there and he asked this in 1991, and um, culminating in the first one in 16 years organizing arts festivals. That's a life sentence if you're ever heard of. And I thought I'm allowed out after 16 years. <laughs> it was nice to go out at the top. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't know how many people we were going to get to the first one. And um, uh, we needed to raise, we managed to raise a million dollars to underwrite it all out of a city of 70,000 people. When people thought it was women in advertising. You know, no one knew what it was, or very few in Taranaki. But by the time we finished scooping up some sponsors, we were then wanting $600,000 in ticket sales to run this thing successfully and meet our budgets. And about two days beforehand, I thought, this is going to work. A man rang me up from Australia and said, you've got something to do with Woman. And I said, yeah, yeah, that's right. He said, where do we stay? I said, how many of you are there? He said, 55. And I said, you stay in the tent city up on the, up on the race course. Mm. Oh, yep, that'll be okay. And then the mayor rings me up at two, two in the afternoon um, when we're starting at six that night. He said, Kerr, what have you done to my city? I said, what, what's the problem, uh, Peter? He said, it's taken me two hours to go from Motamui to the town side of Whitehurst. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we put a bit of nerve about this thing? People from all over the North Island kind of knew what was going on. Yeah, it's great fun to do yeah. things in the arts. I enjoy that. I'm a bit of a promoter, if you like. Thank you. I'm writing yeah. checks now. Yeah. And uh, Linda organizes it. Linda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, what I've done, I've left four copies. Mm. There was a big auction. Peter, I was always on it, Peter, to, to um, uh, try and um, you know, get the sales program going. And he said, well, I'm saving it for my old age. So when he was about 75, I said, you are now this is officially old age. So for Christ's sake, get, get some of this stuff out there. So that's a beautiful, beautiful catalog put together mm. by a, a, a small gallery up in K Road, Balbank Nino. Mm. They've been taken over since then and, and done other things. But this is all pre-1900, uh, pre-2000 work. It's, um, it's, it's dark room stuff. Because mm. the minute digital cameras came along, Peter just backed out. Yes, yes, that's one of the areas. That's right. And that's taken on top of Mount Victoria. Correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. So th th there's a very good essay by a Blouton there. And it's very good because um, an academic person wrote it and Peter corrected it. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> if you're interested in Peter, you can, you can read that essay. But those are a lot of us good work. Um, and you can see he goes right across the spectrum. That's the, yeah, that's another Erica. That's the most famous Erica, Erica in winter. I mean, the art critics say, what's going on here? Is she protecting herself? Is she going to reveal something? Um, you know, what, what's the implication of that? And actually go back to, and that's self-portrait. This is another Erica photograph.